Hey y'all, it's Becky here from The Becky Sphere, where we talk about climate change news and solutions. You've entered the weekly climate recap, where we look at what progress is being made to mitigate and adapt to climate change. If you like this series, please consider subscribing because I'm for, here for you around every Tuesday um, with some extra videos here and there. Stay tuned for more information on those at the end of the video. But let's go ahead and get into this week, which starts on fire in the West Coast. I mean, it's been burning like this for a bit now, but it's getting much worse. California, Oregon and Washington, Nevada, Alaska, New Mexico, Idaho, Montana, Utah, and even Texas. All these states are experiencing unprecedented wildfires and droughts. Texas has been telling people to reduce their air conditioning use because they're worried about the electricity grid freaking out like it did this winter, um, which is a great reminder of how we desperately need to update our electrical infrastructure. The climate is just going to keep getting more extreme and we can't keep telling people to uh, turn their AC off. So. And yeah, so there were there was record breaking heat waves last weekend. Phoenix, Arizona hit 18, or sorry, 118 degrees Fahrenheit or 48 degrees for you silly Celsius folk. Salt Lake City hit 107 degrees. Las Vegas hit 117. The temperature stayed above 90 degrees at night, which is especially gross. And yeah, <laughs> I was in Santa Rosa for part of uh, that weekend and it hit over 100 there too. On top of that, reservoirs like Lake Mead, Lake Powell, and the Colorado River are at the lowest points they have been around this time of year for almost a century, being on the verge of warranting a national emergency declaration. Remember, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down from your residential Californian who has been in a drought her whole life. If you want to learn more about how climate change causes water crises, then click in my, you can click on the link for that. I think it's on the side. And uh, if you want to know how climate change makes wildfires worse, I also did a video on that. I think that was my first video for this channel. There might be some audio problems. I might redo that video, but until then, the link is here. Meanwhile, uh, scientists have determined that the cold spell that hit France's wine industry hard in April is definitely attributable to climate change. They concluded this after analyzing 132 climate models. The Bank of Japan revealed a new plan for, to help provide funds to financial institutions that invest and extend loans for climate change mitigation and adaptation activities. This news follows along with a growing push to sway banks and insurer companies, insurance companies to factor in climate change in their decision making. Maine became the first state to make a law to divest from fossil fuels. The law instructs the state's public employee pensions to divest $1.3 billion from coal, oil, and gas interests within the next five years. A state by the or, sorry, a study by the University of Colorado Boulder projects that krill populations will drop about 30% within the century due to climate change heating up the oceans and changing the natural variability of the Antarctic. Krill are very important baselines for the ocean food chain, so this could cost the fishing industry billions of dollars. The beer company Heineken might soon dole out salaries and bonuses to its Nevada managers based on how committed they are to tackling climate change. The second largest beer company in the world is working to turn its goal of being carbon neutral by 2040 into a reality. About 90% of its emissions come from suppliers, packaging, storage logistics, and transportation of products. A new study by NASA and the National Atmosphere, sorry, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, shows that the amount of heat the Earth traps in has doubled since 2005, which is much more than the administrations in initially anticipated. They're still trying to figure out what's exactly causing this acceleration. 
a uh, large possibility is the less sea ice the, and less cloud cover, which both help reflect energy back out of Earth's atmosphere. Hi, editing Becky here. I explained this one poorly, so here's the gist. The IKEA and Rockefeller Foundations teamed up to put $50 million of capital risk each into a fund to finance small-scale renewable projects meant to lift people out of poverty. Their goal is to attract $10 billion from international development agencies. The Climate Investment Fund, or CIF, secured $2 billion from G7 leaders to help two to three emerging coal-dependent countries to transition to cleaner industries. South Africa, India, and Indonesia are potential candidates. Meanwhile, Coal India, one of the world's largest coal mining companies, announced earlier this week that it will be cutting its workforce by 5% every year for the next five to ten years as it closes unviable mines. On Saturday, 20 activists co congregated outside of London's famous science museum to protest a new carbon capture and storage exhibition because it was sponsored or it is sponsored by Shell. While it's important for the science museum to present climate solutions, this move allows Shell to further greenwash itself. So that's a no for me. In other news, researchers at the University of Delaware emphasized the need to quote manage and carefully retreat, like purposely move people out of the flood zones. They released a video talking about why this form of climate adaptation matters and how quote retreat is not defeat. I like it. What could coastal cities of the future look like? There are a lot more options than you might think, but achieving these features will require reframing the conversation around managed retreat. Managed retreat is a purposeful movement of people, buildings, and other infrastructure away from areas vulnerable to flooding, sea level rise, or other climate change hazards. Using this approach strategically can open the door to new possibilities, to floating cities, elevated cities, consolidated cities, or some other creative combination. By adding managed retreat to our adaptation toolkit, we can pave the way for more creative solutions today as we plan for tomorrow. Because managed retreat doesn't mean defeat. The UN climate policy leader Patricia Espinosa slammed G7 leaders for failing to find $100 billion a year that they had promised to come up with to help developing countries with their green transitions. You thought the 2 to $3 billion was good. She said, quote, We are still very far away from being fully confident of having a full success at COP26. Auditors argue that EU's farming practices meant to decrease emissions in that sector are failing to do so. They announced this ahead of a EU negotiator meeting this week, which will look to create new rules for the common agriculture policy. The scheme is expected to spend a third of EU's budget between now and 2027. Yesterday marked the fourth Hashtag show your stripes challenge where meteorologists around the US show a map of their area's climate anomalies to raise awareness of climate change. Maps are provided by the climate research group, Climate Central, and um, they unfortunately are not everywhere, but there's some. Did your local meteorologist show it? If so, let me know because I'm curious. Um, unfortunately, Monterey doesn't have one, but here is San Jose's stripe map, and here is California's stripe map. Red represents the hotter than average years, while blue represents the cooler than average years. Climate Central launched a new tool also that allows meteorologists and journalists to sign up for alerts when local conditions are connected to climate change. The bulletins are in uh, will include TV-ready graphics to help reporters and weather folk break down the news. This is all to encourage more climate coverage, which is booming right now. So if you want a job in climate coverage, now's the time to get the job. Um, but it's still not as prominent as it should be. And the initiative link is also in the resources section below. Today, Australia's Environmental Minister, Susan Lay, rejected UNESCO's downgrading of the Great Barrier Reef's world heritage status to endangered due to climate change, a decision that will be made final at a meeting in China next month. 
this is very a, a weird hill for Australia to die on for them to be upset about that uh, about the world heritage thing being hurt because they've known for a long time that coral reefs are hurt by climate change and I think a reason why Australia is taking it so personally is because it further highlights the country's need to create concrete ambitious climate pledges something that they have failed to do while other world leaders have announced their own so it just kind of emphasizes their lack of action in that area. The Great Barrier Reef, meanwhile, is home to 1,600 species of fish and over 600 species of coral, making it a major oceanic biodiversity hub. It adds $6.4 billion annually to Australia's economy and is the backbone for 64,000 jobs, in addition to also being a natural break, uh, wave break for the continent. Australia says that UNESCO's um, dumb because <laughs> their reef is pristine, but they can't be saying that while also not curbing their own emissions. A new study shows that the aviation sector's target to cut carbon emissions will likely not be met, especially as the global economy works to recover from COVID, so more people will probably be flying. The study's co-author had this to say about it. Quote, Technological improvements to engines and airframes and operations won't be enough to sufficiently reduce the impacts of aviation on climate change. We must explore all mitigation options in parallel, including the increased use of sustainable fuels and market-based measures in order to limit aviation's impact on the environment. Accounting for sustainable fuels must include the impact of non-CO2 emissions in use as well as the CO2 emissions in fuel production. If we base all of our calculations on CO2 alone, we miss the large improvements in non-CO2 emissions that these fuels can offer, particularly in reducing particulate matter emissions, which contribute to an increased warming effect at cruise conditions. Honestly, this is not terribly surprising um, to me because we haven't really developed the technology to properly bring flight emissions down and airlines are unlikely to support the move to fly less. Need an example? Look at the EU airlines from last week. Aviation is one of the sectors that will probably be the last to decarbonize, but we should still work on it. Devon Energy Corp, the largest independent US oil producer, announced its plans to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions in its operations and energy use by 2050. Which to me sounds a lot like a marketing stunt considering it's still an oil company, but I'm glad that at least the promise to decrease all greenhouse gases was made because that will also include methane. A Finnish study finds that climate change is increasing mercury levels in fish. This is because warmer waters encourage more algae growth, which include, increases mercury levels in the environment. The study also says that the practices that worsen climate change also make also cause more mercury, such as destructive land use. Mercury is highly poisonous to humans, if you didn't know. Finally, I want to leave you with some fruit for thought coming from an Inside Climate News article that I came across this week. A study published in the National Communications Journal last month argued that degrowth, or the purposeful push to downscale production and consumption of rich countries while maintaining their people's quality of life, might get us closer to hitting Paris targets than relying on unproven technologies like carbon capture. Degrowth might provide a more secure path to healing our planet because it also tackles other environmental problems that coincide with climate change. So that's my question for you. What do you think? Do you think we should wait on the technology we have or we should move more on this systemic change? I'll leave the article below if you want to have a look for yourself and please comment below what you think about this argument. I also will link a recent video done by Charlie from Our Changing Climate, which talks more about degrowth. And that was the climate recap for June 16th to 22nd. Please let me know if I missed anything in the comments below. Also, let me know if you would, uh, what would you title this recap? I'm always looking for ideas on creating more engaging titles for these segments. So if you got a good one, I will make it this title. Feel free to even go back to the previous climate recaps to give me better titles. <laughs>
And as for the Becca's Beer news, brace yourself because I've got two extra videos coming this week. We got one on the energy, the International Energy Agency, I think it's called, Intergovernmental en Energy Agency, talking about what they recommended for moving to carbon net zero and also talking about nuclear with Mickey. And remember to support uh, your local news organizations and to talk about climate change every single day. And I will see you later this week. Bye for now. Oop, this one.